What is up, theology nerds? This is Trip, and you're listening to Homebrewed Christianity. That's right. Since 2008, we've been dropping some audiological goodness, interviews with scholars of religion, theologians, biblical scholars, uh, philosophers, scientists, all sorts of different forms and kinds of inquiry into those big old questions humans have been asking around campfires ever since day one. Well, 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 this episode today is cray-cray in a good way. That's right. I'm joined not by one, but two friends. Uh, my friend and fellow faculty member here at the University of Edinburgh, Sarah Lane Ritchie, is back on the podcast. Uh, we both are part of the Religion and Science uh, Collective here, which, by the way, by the way, if you want to hang out with us, there are uh, degrees you can come get. There's online science, philosophy, religion degree. There's in-person uh, degrees, masters, PhD, all that kind of exciting stuff. Well, Sarah and I, we had a guest come to give a lecture. And not only is Dr. Jonathan Jung a guest lecturer for our science and religion seminar, he is a part of my larger project that I'm working on. So um, he's he, he's becoming a friend. He's a brilliant scholar, uh, a fun mentor to have. And he's also a parish priest who just happens to be um, a practicing scientist, right? He is a part of the Institute for Cognitive and Evolutionary Anthropology at Oxford and the Ian Ramsey Center for Science and Religion at Oxford and an assistant professor and fellow at Coventry University Center for Trust, Peace, and Social Relations. He does all sorts of different cognitive science of religion uh, info, um, research, and all that kind of stuff. But uh, he was on the podcast previously where we talk more about that. In this episode, the three of us have a conversation that I hope all of you interested in religion and science are, are ready for because it talks about and we wrestle with different ways of understanding uh, the role and function of science in, in, a, in religious conversation. Um, how science impacts the plausibility, veracity, and uh, nature of belief and faith, um, and 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 really, uh, it's it quickly turned into three people talking without knowing, or at least consciously knowing <laughs> that someone else is going to hear this later. I personally love these type of episodes, and I know certain individuals that listen to completely dig it. But here's what I'm asking you. Uh, I've been collecting a whole bunch of uh, questions around religion and science that people have sent in. And Sarah, Lane Ritchie, and I are going to do some episodes answering them. Uh, so if you are new to a lot of this conversation and listen through this and are trying to figure things out and want to know why we said X, Y, or Z, then just send me in your questions. My email is podcast at trip fuller no, or homebrewed Christianity.com. My name's trip fuller. So podcast at homebrewed Christianity.com. Send in your questions or topics that came up or things you were thinking about, and we'll be doing some Q&A episodes around different religion and science topics in the near future. But, yeah, that's all I want to say because it's a long, fun, super nerdy conversation. Hit pause, send me in those topics and questions, and uh, we'll pick them up. Uh, before I jump in, I just want to remind everyone a couple things. One, uh, this podcast is listener-supported by amazing people. Like Aaron Brenner, who's a brand new bishop at Homebrewed Christianity. That's right. Boom shakalaka. Aaron just joined up a bishop at Homebrewed. So my brother joined. Okay, that's weird. He just must love me. That's how you know your brother really loves you. Stephen Fuller, my brother, he's now a member of the Homebrewed community. Not because um, we're related. Um, I think it was because he wanted to get the Walter Brueggemann lectures and he didn't want to ask me. I don't know if that's for, that, that's true or not. Uh, but Stephen, I do love you as a friend and as a brother. And I've met people who do not have as cool of brothers as me. That's right. He's awesome. Um, <laughs> anyway, they are both brand new members to the Homebrewed community. And you can be too. Go to homebrewedcommunity.com and you can get all the back episodes for the private Homebrewed Christianity uh, podcast feed that's just for community members and right on the horizon 
you're going to be getting delivered to that private feed all of the lectures and Q&As and content for the upcoming class with John freaking Cobb. John Cobb and I, which if you, the previous episode's a special announcement that goes into detail about this class, but John Cobb and I are putting together the largest online seminar of Alfred North Whitehead. Well, it's going to be the largest seminar of Whitehead, and we're using the internet to make it so. And John Cobb, he is 95 at the beginning of this class, 95 years old, greatest living interpreter of Alfred North Whitehead, the, the process philosopher, right? And you get to wrestle with his masterpiece text, Process and Reality, with the wit and wisdom and guidance of John Cobb. In me. <laughs> I'm mostly going to be uh, making sure John keeps sharing. Um, we'll see. Um, but you'll have an online class. You'll get lectures each week. You'll be walking through the text. Everyone that donates to the group, if you aren't a member and you want to join, you can sign up. Everyone that donates to the group gets the Whitehead Word Book where John explains a lot of the vocabulary words. You can have it right next to you when you're doing your reading. Uh, it's going to be a blast. Uh, there'll be other special guests that are process-related uh, in the class, like uh, Catherine Keller and such, that will tell us different ways Whitehead has impacted uh, their work on different topics. So it could be like ecology or engaging post-structuralism or doing constructive theology in different religious traditions or how Whitehead connects to Eastern types of philosophy versus the Western theological use that you're probably more familiar with on the podcast or how Whitehead thinks through uh, the issue of consciousness and pan-experientialism and such. But all that to say, this is going to be fun. And to sign up, you can go to the website. Um, I made a special one for the class, alfrednorthwhitehead.com. <laughs> alfrednorthwhitehead.com or processandreality.com. Both of them currently will send you to sign up for this class. And uh, remember, it's donation-based, so you can donate a lot and um, you can donate very little. You can donate none. Um, we really want as many people to participate in this. Everyone that signs up will get it downloaded so you can have it in the future. So there's no need uh, if you can't give all the attention you want now not to sign up. That way you get it sent to you. Um, but yeah, I'm pumped. So head to homebrewedcommunity.com if you want to join the community. Go to alfordnorthwhitehead.com if you want to sign up just for this class. And uh, buckle your scientific safety belts. Why, you say? Because this conversation around science gets spiritual, it gets religious, it gets philosophical. And um, really, the fun part is, Jonathan, Sarah, and I occupy very different positions. <laughs> and if you can uh, parse them out, then you basically probably should study it in graduate school because, uh, yeah, yeah, this is no undergrad level convo. Enjoy. <laughs> All right, hello, homebrew Christianity listeners. This is Trip, and we're sitting in Sarah Lane Ritchie's office, and uh, we have a very special guest today. Yeah, so Jonathan's going to talk about experimenting with religion. Can scientists study gods, souls, and rituals? Yes. Mm. Oh yeah. So, how does a scientist study a soul? And uh, like, how do you even begin to phrase that question? Yeah, I, th I think. The, the thing to remember about what psychologists do is that we're, we're interested in people's beliefs about things and, as it were, not the things themselves. So, so the, you know, phrasing the question in terms of can scientists study gods, souls, and rituals, uh, setting aside the rituals side of things for, for a moment, the, the straightforward answer is, is no, right? It's also not what we try to do. What we do try to do is work out how people feel about what people do about what people believe about things like gods and souls. And, and that's kind of my way of saying, look, if you're worried about people crossing boundaries, like th this is like a very clear boundary between what psychologists do and what, what theologians do. Like I, like I'm as quay psychologist, I'm not interested in whether God exists. I'm not interested in, uh, how many souls can dance on the head of a pin, right? My, my job is to work out what people think about this and, and why they think these things about, about, about gods and souls. Mm -hmm. So I didn't know souls could dance. Um, I know angels dance on the head of pins, but souls, that's, 
That's even more. Is that how good your preaching is? Well, the metaphysical question is the same, right? Because what yeah. you have is a, is a non-material object, uh, which may or may not occupy space. And if they occupy space, the question is, in what mode do they occupy space? So the classic Thomist answer to the, 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 the angel on the pins question is, is one. One, well, it depends how you divide up the, the, the pin, really. That's more important than how you divide up the angel. So it's true that angels don't occupy space, but for, in, in Thomas's metaphysics of causation, uh, the location of an angel corresponds directly to their location of action, not their location of like physical space occup- o- occupancy. Um, and, and Thomas also thinks that you can only have one cause per location. Therefore, you can only have one angel per location. So if the head of a pin is one location, then you can only have one angel on the head of a pin. But the same, exactly the same metaphysical questions apply for souls because they're the same kind of object. They're, you know, metaphysical, uh, they're non, non-physical objects. I really feel like the number of people that are going to give that answer next time, how many angels can dance on the head of the pin, uh, has gone up significantly. Like, there, people are going to say that to their minister who's listening to this, and they're like, actually, there's a very technical answer to this. I don't know if you knew this, but according to Thomas Aquinas' appropriation of Aristotelian metaphysics, uh, you can only have one angel right, in one, one location. Angel. So yeah, I don't know what's odd is. about this. And then yeah. to debate it was really a metaphysical debate. And that's still, but it, but it is. I mean, I think, you know, pe- people, people say about the angels and the pin thing that it's a silly question, but it's not, right? Because, uh, it, there, there, there are lots of questions about the nature of infinity. There are lots of questions about the nature of space. There are lots of questions about the nature of causation that, that, that can be brought to bear on a question like this. I think there's nothing silly about, about the question. I think we should disabuse people of the notion that, that these questions are dumb. But what is a really dumb question that people ask you? Uh, so, I, so part part of the talk that I'm giving today is is to I think try to help people get over their prejudices about uh about the the psychological sciences in general and also the psychological sciences as they pertain to things like like religion. So so in some ways I think the question you know like can psychologists study religion like is a sort of dumb question for for two reasons. Uh, one reason is is easy, which is that. Like we have just have been doing it for like a hundred years. Uh, and if, if that's the case, then it seems obvious that we can do it. Um, and, and then the less dumb reason, uh, the, the less easy reason that it's a dumb question is that the, a lot of objections that people throw at psychology as a science, um, leads you to think that lots of other things are not possible. Um, so, so uh, uh, as I'll say later today, um, Lots of people think that we have a, a measurement problem, right? So, uh, um, how does the argument go? So mental states are invisible things that are inside people's heads. Uh, so how do you measure these things? You have to do so indirectly by inferring mental states from behaviors or physiological states, but surely that's really unreliable, et cetera, et cetera. The two problems with this is that, um, one, it is literally what all of us do all the time, inferring mental states from behaviors, uh, and, and to some extent physiology. And if you think that psychologists can't do it, then you must also think that you can't do it. And therefore, first dates will be even harder than they currently are, <laughs> and so forth. Uh, and then, and then the second problem is that if you throw away psycho- psychological measurement on the basis that it's indirect inference, then you have to throw away almost every other kind of scientific measurement that isn't literally using a tape measure to measure mm-hmm. your height. Um, in, in, the, in the modern age, virtually all scientific measurement is, is indirect. Um, and, and so it goes. There are lots of things about psychology as a science that are in principle. So, so there are lots of challenges that we face in the real world, but a lot of the objections that people throw are, are sort of silly. And, and sometimes these are objections that psychologists themselves generate, right? So, so there's this question of whether or not psychology can ever have formal theories, by which I mean theories that are, um, that, that, that can take mathematical form, um, from which you can derive predictions, um, logically as opposed to by opinion. Um, and lots of people, including lots of psychologists, think that this is not possible. Um, and they'll say two things. They'll say, well, human behavior is, is, is not deterministic and therefore not amenable to, to mathematical precision. And then the second thing they say is that, um, uh, human behavior is complex and therefore not amenable to, to mathematical precision. But, you know, tell that to a, a quantum mechanics mm-hmm. professor. Or tell that to a meteorologist, right? So, so it just is true that in the physical sciences, there are lots of things that are A, not deterministic and B, complex, but we're perfectly happy to model them mathematically mm-hmm. and, and do much more precise science than psychologists are happy to do. So, so these are not objections by like people who hate psychology, right? These are 
yeah. objections by people who are within psychology. And I think they're, they're equally mm-hmm. dumb as, as criticisms or excuses made about psychology. Mm-hmm. So Sarah, when, when the concept of soul comes up, thinking of how people normally hear it mm-hmm. in a Christian context to the debate that's happened in the 20th century. Mm-hmm. Um, like how would you introduce the theological conversation around soul and the role science plays in thinking it through? Um, so, I mean, as you know, I think the soul is a theologically unnecessary concept. Um, there are a variety of ways that you can attack that from within biblical studies, from within theology, from within philosophy. Um, I think what I, um, what it depends on who I'm talking to. So if I'm talking to your, uh, if I'm talking to like a, a relative in Michigan, for example, evangelical Christian, that sort of thing. Um, my first, the first conversation I want to have is to ask them what, theological role is the soul playing for you? What are you hoping for when you insist on a soul? Are you hoping that you have some way of interacting with God? Are you happy? Are you hoping that you're able to affirm, uh, immortality in some way? So is, is, it, is the question really like, how do we survive death in a meaningful way? Um, or is it a question of wanting to be more than the physical world? So if, if, if your insistence on having a soul is about preserving some aspect of the human person that escapes reductionism or escapes scientific explanation, okay, well then that's, that's, that's helpful to know as well. So your answer, my answer, the answer that they give me to the question of like, what role is the soul playing for you then kind of affects the, the conversation from then on out. So for example, if the fear is that, well, if we lose the soul, then how in the world do we affirm immortality? Well, Christian theology has the answers for that, right? So we have the resurrection of the body, right? So there are ways to, there are ways to, um, affirm, uh, continued existence after death that don't require an, an immaterial soul. If the question is, uh, well, I want to make sure that I can affirm human divine interaction. Okay, well, now we're talking about divine action. Um, and the question then becomes, well, what does the soul give you? Well, a lot of people will say, well, we can't explain the soul. So we can't explain the mind. Usually what you'll find very quickly is that people conflate mind and soul. So when they say mind, they mean soul. When they say soul, they mean mind. Um, and so people think that, well, because we don't have a, uh, a perfectly accessible understanding of our explanation of the subjective experience of consciousness. Well, then that's the point where God can interact with us. And that's, that's our sort of the, the, the soul of our spirituality, as it were, right? So the soul gives us a sort of a supernatural aspect to ourselves that allows us to have communion with God. Well, again, this is, uh, this is a, this is, uh, tapping into implicit assumptions that we have about the God nature relationship. So, um, if you're saying that you need to have an immaterial soul in which to interact with God, then you're actually saying quite a bit about metaphysics. You're saying that the only way that you have, that you can get this, like, out there God into your physical world is to sort of find an indeterministic place where God and humanity can interact. Well, that's a very particular sort of metaphysic, and it's not the only one on offer. There are other God world models that you could that you could rely on, and uh, so say. Then, then the th- third option is well, I uh, or the third the third concern is that if you get rid of an immaterial soul, then you're basically saying that humans are basically nothing but quarks and neurons, right? Um, well, then that seems to mean that we're nothing, that we're not spiritual beings, that we're not we're not we don't we don't have any sort of imago dei, we're not special in any way. Um, so if that's your concern, then we can have an interesting discussion about compatibilism. We can have an interesting discussion about the, the compatibilism between scientific explanations and theological affirmations. And so basically, the, when I start to talk about the soul with people, the first thing I want to do is find out what their real concerns are. Because there are a range of theological answers to each of those concerns. So are those type of concerns, how, how do those show up when you're thinking about or, or, you know, surveying people or interacting with people, if you're not questioning the reality of what they refer to, but um, how it functions, how how do the different reasons someone may latch on to the concept of soul impact the way you test it or assess it? Most psychologists at, at the moment are interested in whether or not um, people have uh, what you might think of as a sort of intuitive belief in uh, in, in something like a soul. Uh, so, so the work that psychologists do are, are, is just conceptually much less precise than the work that philosophers and theologians do, in part because, uh, as Sarah was saying, people do conflate things, you know, minds and souls, etc. And and so and so we 
we don't we don't assume that regular people draw like very clear boundaries between different parts of what what might make up a human being right so uh, body mind soul etc nor nor do we assume that when people say that they believe in uh, say an immaterial soul that their beliefs are self con- are internally in- uh, internally consistent so 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 you know uh people are perfectly happy with depictions of um of you know ghosts which are supposed to be immaterial but yet somehow occupy space and you know uh it's true that they can pass through walls but also like they're standing in front of you and so so and and all of that uh might upon closer inspection seem unreasonable or or like logically incoherent uh but but that but as it were that's just part of doing business if you're studying humans for if you're a psychologist right so the thing so so we we don't draw these these boundaries we don't draw these these uh these conceptual categories very clearly what we're interested in is in uh whether or not um people broadly speaking across cultures and from quite a young age draw distinctions between uh your body uh and let's say you or some other aspect of you that is somehow different from your body um so so sometimes we we do this via questionnaires and there are any number of of ways to ask questions of what people believe makes them uh you know like how many parts do you have etc and and what functions they 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 occupy but actually most of the interesting studies are 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 on children who who like you know uh you there are lots of questions you can't ask children because they won't give you the sorts of answers that you're looking for. So what we do instead is we run um, we run experiments. Um, one of my favorite experiments uh, has to do with uh, with cloning hamsters. So there's a guy uh, at Bristol um, called Bruce Hood uh, who worked with uh, the Yale psychologist Paul Bloom on this particular project. And and what they did was they they had this box. And they, 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 they showed these kids, sort of five, six year old kids, that if you put an object in the box, uh, and you press the button, it'll, it'll beep for a little while, and then you'll, and then you'll get two of exactly the same object. So the kids understand that what this box does is it, it duplicates whatever object you put in it. And then they, they show the children a, a real life hamster, uh, uh, and, and they, they, they tell the children, look, this hamster is very special. Um, it, it has a blue heart. Its heart is blue in color. Uh, you can't see it, but it's, it's there. Um, also before, before, um, before you were, before today, before now, the hamster accidentally swallowed a marble. So it's got marble in its belly and you can't see that either, but it's there. And also while swallowing the marble, the marble chipped a tooth at the back of its, of its, of its mouth, which you also can't see, but it's there. And also now, uh, you know, child, we would like you to play with the hamster and whisper your name into the hamster's ear and show the hamster this really interesting drawing that you made earlier um, and also tickle its belly. Okay, now, so now you have six facts about the hamster, right? Three physical facts, which you can't see, uh, blue heart, marble, chip tooth, and three uh, psychological facts of the hamster that you can't see. Uh, all three of them are, are memories. Memory of the child's name, uh, memory of what the picture looks like that a child drew and a memory of the experience of being tickled by the child. You put a hamster in the machine, press the button, it beeps. Then you have suddenly you have two hamsters, identical looking hamsters. Um, they, they did in fact use two hamsters. Um, and, and then they asked the child, okay, so this is the original hamster. Does it still have a blue heart? Right. Does it still have a marble in its belly? Does it still have a chipped tooth? Does it remember your name? Does it remember you're tickling it? Does it remember the picture that you drew? And then they ask the same question of the clone hamster. So this is not the original hamster. This is a duplicate. Does it have a blue heart, etc.? And what you find is that children are perfectly happy with the physical traits duplicating. So the, the clone hamster has a blue heart, has marble in its belly, has a chipped tooth. They're much less happy uh, saying that the memories duplicate, right? So, so if you think of the... Like if if it's the case that eighty to ninety percent of the kids think that the physical traits duplicate, only about forty percent of the kids think that um, the psychological traits duplicate. Right, um, and then as a control condition, um, what they do is they take a, a digital camera and they say that the digital camera has blue batteries and like a broken latch, etc. So a bunch of physical traits, and then they take photos and videos and voice recordings on the camera. So you have camera memories as well, and then you clone the camera and you ask the kids the same kinds of questions. And, and in that condition, children are perfectly happy saying that even the memories, quote unquote, memories of the camera duplicate, right? So it seems like the reluctance to talk about, um, uh, memories duplicating 
is, is specific to, to biological organisms. Okay. So what do you conclude from that? Right. What, what, what psychologists conclude from this is that children from quite a young age, age five, draw like an interesting distinction between physical traits and psychological traits such that the latter don't duplicate. Uh, now, if you, if you think about physicalism, if you think that your memories are all in your brain in some way, and if you think that the brain is duplicated by the du duplicating machine, then it stands to reason that the memory should duplicate as well. So, so what the psychologists can conclude from this is that that's not how children think about memories, that somehow they're not, this, they're not coextensive with, or with the physiological arrangement of your brain, right? Um, okay, so that doesn't speak to the existence of a soul, right? But it does speak to, to something about, uh, humans' intuitions about, uh, A, whether or not uh, something exists beyond just your physical body and be what kind of role that it plays, right? This is to your point about consciousness. And I think this means, what this means for theologians, or I think what this means for pedagogues of theology is that, like, we have an uphill battle to climb if you want to disabuse people of the notion that, uh, that, you know, a sensible thing to do is to, is to divide the human person into body and soul. And, and, and if you want to disabuse people from the idea that, that the soul fulfills certain psychological functions, the problem seems to be that this comes really, really early. And, and so, and so, um, by the time people are 30 years old, they've had a, just a long time of seeping, uh, and reflecting on this intuitive belief. And, and so, so this is how psychology can be helpful, right? To, to pedagogues, just to, to kind of remind us where people are starting from and, right? How, how, mm -hmm. how, how kind of basic these ideas are. Uh, and, and hopefully, right, not, it doesn't just tell us how difficult the job is going to be to re-teach people different sorts of things. But, but, you know, follow-ups to that kind of study might, might give us strategies as to how to do it. Okay. So this is really interesting because you are a person who is, um, you're in a very small, uh, camp, um, where you wear more than one hat, right? So you're a, you're an experimental psychologist. You're also ordained. Right. So you are able to operate in these different roles and um, with different methodologies. And you're a fascinating person because you are the sort of uh, player within the science and religion world um, who wants to actually you seem to want to have a clear distinction between your roles and methods. So you often will use language, for example, as um, me qua scientist or me qua um, ordained person. Um, and so you're able to sort of distinguish between what you can say in either capacity. So I'm wondering to what extent you can integrate these roles within yourself and integrate your methodologies and your insights and say something about the extent to which what you know about the, the sort of very natural disp cognitive dis dispositions we have to form very particular sorts of God concepts at a very early age. To what extent are those indicative of something more than just sort of our, um, just sort of, you know, like a byproduct of other, of other, of other evolved capacities that we would have for, you know, various reasons. Um, and I say this specifically because of, um, of a sort of like the justification of belief question, right? So, um, I have a, a dear friend of mine, one of my best friends is an astrobiologist in Oxford. And, um, we go back and forth all the time on how, how justified we are in, um, even hoping for metaphysical realities like God. And it, she's a fascinating person. Her name is Dr. Uh, Sarah Rugheimer. She's a fascinating person because she's a person who is very, very acutely aware of her own cognitive biases. And she views her own desire to not only believe, but to believe in a certain sort of God. So like, as you've mentioned, we know that um, children are <laughs> likely to form beliefs about um, very sort, certain, certain characters form beliefs in certain um, divine characteristics and attributes of God, not only just some vague idea of God. Um, she takes that research that you're, that you, you know, spend so much time on. And she says, actually, this is exactly why I should not ever feel confident in forming any theological or religious belief whatsoever. There are so many reasons why I would have an intuitions and beliefs that have evolved for reasons that have nothing to say about metaphysical realities. We are so good at fooling ourselves and in, informing in, in beliefs that don't correspond to reality. So I'm wondering, because you do wear these different hats, if you can speak a bit to um, why we should ever take uh, religious belief seriously as sort of like a, as, as sort of indicating some metaphysical reality or corresponding to some metaphysical reality when we have so many reasons to doubt the, um, the, the, the correspondence between our beliefs and, and what is, what is accurate about reality. I think it's important to draw a distinction between 
believing something mm -hmm. and uh and and being supremely confident that something is true mm -hmm. right um so that that's that's one way into the question uh is to say that knowing a lot about how cognition works about how learning works etc um i don't i don't think means that you, you have to throw all your beliefs mm -hmm. away right um uh and but but it, but it might temper the attitude that you take toward your beliefs right so that's that's one set of things to say the the second thing to say is 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 about throwing babies away with, with bath waters mm -hmm. um it's true that there are there are all kinds of causal explanations um about how we form say religious beliefs but of course the same is true for any other kind of belief mm -hmm. right so so um our ability to do mathematics are are even very basic things like perceptual beliefs so the fact that um that human beings happen to see in color mm -hmm. that some of our cells respond to relationships between light and dark so that we we draw physical boundaries between objects mm -hmm. etc like you know a, a a true skeptic could say well all of that is a product of of like not only neural physiology but the but but the way the way eyeballs work mm -hmm. right um so 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 i think in in some ways skepticism about uh religious belief uh, or about metaphysical beliefs more broadly, um, is, is kind of insufficiently skeptical because mm -hmm. you could take that, uh, really, really far. Uh, and there's no, there's no real way of drawing up a, a, a boundary between how far you, you take the thing, except on purely pragmatic grounds. I know people say, well, you know, we couldn't possibly believe that we're brains and bats because, you know, where would that lead us? And, and, you know, and, you know, and, and sure. So you can draw a pragmatic line and say, I will only believe the things that are, like useful to believe and mm -hmm. not the things that are, that are like metaphysical speculation-y. Um, but, but then, but that wouldn't be, that, that itself wouldn't be an evidence-based distinction, mm -hmm. right? That would, that would just be a prudential principle. Um, so, so I think when you take those two things together, um, you suddenly have, I think, quite a lot of latitude. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I think what, what that leads to is an attitude toward, um, I, I don't want to say religious beliefs specifically. I think beliefs that you might think of as, as metaphysical more broadly. Mm -hmm. So, and this, this, this includes everything from like physical causation beliefs. The fact that, you know, object A bumps into object B and object B moves and then you, you make a causal attribution. Mm -hmm. Even that level of metaphysical belief, I think, uh, is covered by, by the thing I'm about to say, which is that, um, that all of those things, I think, you know, fit within your, uh, your scheme once you have a basic set of like commitments that you, can admit are are not like fully defensible mm -hmm. right so so once you have a, a, a bunch of principles you can build up from that and and believe the things that are entailed by the building up without saying that you know for sure that you're right about these okay things. so this is really interesting so let's say that we can say that um when you look at the research on religion within cognitive science experimental psychology that um let's say let's say that we can adopt a position of neutrality Let's say that the science itself is not going to indicate one way or the other whether or not um, the, the 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 particular religious beliefs that we subscribe to are in fact representative of ultimate reality. So, um, so you again are a person who is able to wear these different hats, right? And so, let's say that you as a, let, let's say for the for the moment that you are a person who is quite happy to say yes, I believe in the in, in the Christian God as 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 traditionally understood, or you know maybe with some caveats in there. Let's say that I'm also looking at the same set of research and facts, intellectual arguments for or against God, you know, various ways of understanding uh, what a plausible, you know, reason to believe might be, that kind of thing. And let's say that I'm like, yeah, but like, I just don't think it's true. Like, it just doesn't seem true to me. So I'm curious, like, given that you could have two people who are basically saying, yeah, I think the science is neutral here. What do you think would separate you from me in that in that instance? Um, a, is it, I, I mean, my sense is that it's just like one person has had an experiential kind of knowledge that make it's like a very William Jamesy kind of thing, right? Like one person has had an experiential knowledge of that reality that makes it true for them in a way that the other person has not. But I'm curious about how you would think about that difference. What propels one person into a, an experiential belief, whereas the other person could agree to with all the same facts and the neutrality of the science? And 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 uh, not come to that kind of conclusion. Can I ask a question real quick? Yes. No, I, you're, you're out well, of no, this conversation. No, no, this is now. this really helps. I'm, I'm asking the if they're listening and <laughs> and uh, all the gaps that were not said because you don't feel like you need to to your peer. 
But if you listen to the podcast, let's take uh, someone like Justin Barrett, yeah. who, if you took the science neutrally, will then say theologically, uh, all the things that make you more suspicious yes. make him more confident yes. that the God who was revealed in Christ would have a species evolve to what? Uh, you know, lean in towards the right. actual, you know, uh, idea of God. And you've critiqued that as well. So um, yeah. if people have been listening to all the psychological science episodes in yeah. theology, there's multiple positions, and this is yes. that conversation yes. if you weren't picking it up. Yes. <laughs> so go ahead, <laughs> Jonathan. <laughs> so there, there, there are two questions in here, right? So mm -hmm. one is a question about uh, explaining, causally explaining what what the difference is between these two individuals. And the other is the question of, 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 just, of justification. How, how would one justify one position and the other justify the other position? Um, so I think that the, the answer to the, the first question, the causal explanation question, is just the thing that all sociologists of religion know, which is that you have the religious beliefs you do mostly because of where you were born mm -hmm. and to whom and what context you grew up in. The best predictor of your religious um, affiliation and your religious habits and beliefs are your parents and your social contexts. Mm -hmm. Um, that's not very interesting, mm -hmm. right? That's not an interesting explanation. Um, the, and, and, and so I think that the, the kind of interesting question is the one of, about justification. And, and it seems to depend, I think, on, on your metaphysical priors. Mm -hmm. So let's go back to the soul thing, right? So the way you talk to, to people in Michigan or wherever about the soul is to go straight to function, mm -hmm. to, uh, to, you know, what role in, in their particular, like, theological scheme is it playing, mm -hmm. et cetera. Uh, so, so I, so I used to be very skeptical about the necessity of, uh, of positing souls in large part because, uh, I went through the same process that you did, right? Mm -hmm. Like here are some functions. We don't actually, it, this seems redundant. Um, but then of course, y you don't have to start with theological function. You can go all the way back and go, okay, what, like, what are things made of? Mm -hmm. Right. You start with very bare bones, uh, ontology, mm -hmm. right? And if you happen to think for, whatever reason, right? Say you have reasons that everything is composed of form and matter, right? Uh, then the belief in a soul just follows from the fact that everything fall, everything con uh, is composed of form and matter. Mm -hmm. You take a human being, there is matter, physical stuff, and there is form. And that form is what we call the soul. So, so that's not an argument from theological function. That's just, that's just an argument from, from your basic metaphysical commitments. Mm -hmm. So, so I think that, that the, the rational justification for interpreting things like scientific studies one way or the other will come from things like that, will mm -hmm. come from your very basic metaphysical commitments. Not, not even necessarily your, your like interesting, sexy theological commitments, but your, your very basic metaphysical commitments, mm -hmm. things like the distinction between, between form and matter. Mm -hmm. In, one of the things I, I I don't really know what to make of, but depending on who you're hanging out with, how you interpret the very same, like I sometimes tell people when they want to affirm something mm -hmm. or to get past something, all you really got to do is pick a different group of friends for six months, and right. you'll get there, right? right? So, um, the like I'm interested in how like your conversation, like if we all have approximately the right. same. Uh, cognitive mechanisms that lead to religion and dualism and all these types of intuitions and you, and you understand them. Um, what, how do you see your community curation function as a minister? Does that make sense? Like the, like if you see those mechanisms, you can put them in different theological contexts, you can interpret them in different metaphysical contexts, uh, but when you're functioning as, uh, a steward of the sacred in a religious community, um, then, you know, you can't, like, uh, I don't know, forget <laughs> what's go, the mechanisms that are going on, but you also are doing it on behalf of, uh, some type of traction you see, uh, between ultimate reality and the community and what it confesses. And it can never be merely cerebral, right? Like, this is yeah. always embodied. This is always, this is always experiential. I mean, it's like, so I'm really interested in this group of people, of people who don't believe in, in God or wouldn't say that they believe in God, but would love to. Like, there's actually quite a few people out there like that who are kind of hungry for some sort of, um, like, we call it spiritual connection, but you can, I can, you could even go stronger and say, no, I would love to have a religious belief. I would, I'm totally open to that. I'm intellectually, like, I, I can, I can, I can take on board the sort of intellectual frameworks that are necessary to kind of get yourself there. But like, 
can you choose experiential belief? And I think that's clearly the question you're getting at as well. So like your context and the experiences that you're exposing yourself to and the conversations and the culture and the assumptions that you are engaged in on a daily basis are, 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 are at least, at least, um, contributing to, if not actually deciding what you actually believe. So, but I think the question here, like how much agency do communities and ministers and individuals have in the, their, the, in the way that, their um, their whole person is experiencing uh, the possibility of God as a reality. I think right. So it, it's true that, as it were, you can't choose your your experiences. Um, but so if you, you take experience very broadly, um, uh, you can have an experience of a text, mm-hmm. for example, right? right? Um, so let, let's pretend that you this text has been inflicted upon you mm-hmm. by a school or something like this. Yeah. And so you don't get to choose having the experience of the text. Uh, but, but what you can do is to learn to read better. Right. right. So, so we teach hermeneutics um, to divinity students and we teach um, language literature scholars, mm-hmm. how to read, etc. cetera. Um, and, and that expands what you can do with, mm-hmm. with the same experience. And the same is true, I think for, for, for scientific discoveries and, and, and so both empirical discoveries as well as, as scientific theories, right? So all these things uh, are amenable to interpretation. Now, the the experience constrains your interpretation. It's just not the case that the sentence um, a cat on a mat can mean, you know, um, corks spin furiously or something like mm-hmm. this, right? Like there there are some there are some things that are that constrain the way we can interpret things. But 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 skills of interpretation and management interpretation uh, do go quite quite a long way. I think, you know, th- there is a long tradition of, of, uh, of historians thinking, uh, uh, well, historians, philosophers and theologians thinking of, of nature as a book in the same way that we think of sc- scripture as a book. And I think one of the lessons about that is that, uh, is that both things are, are interpreted. We were having this conversation before we started recording about the way certain kinds of Christians interpret the song of songs um, and, and how, you know, this borders on, if not completely crosses the line toward anti-Semitism. Uh, I think, okay, so we can have lots of conversations about that particular phenomenon, but I think the, the thing to acknowledge is that, um, uh, Jews have certain ways of reading texts and certain kinds of Christians have certain ways of reading texts. It's not obvious to me that it's interesting to ask the question about who's right about this. What you have is a text and there are ways to violate the text if you just completely misread words. Right. But, but I think the, the latitude for acceptable interpretation happens to be quite broad. Mm-hmm. And I also think that about, about scientific discoveries and theories mm-hmm. that, that we, we often forget that when scientists do science, when they're giving us a theory of how the world works, they're leaving a lot of interp- interpretation to us. So, so the, the classic example here is, is quantum mechanics, right? So, so we have somehow accepted the idea that quantum mechanics entails um, something really strange about the world. Uh, it entails indeterminacy. It entails, um, uh, you know, causation at a distance, etc. Uh, but of course, that's only true on a particular interpretation of quantum me- of quantum mechanics. So quantum mechanics is just a way of doing maths, right? Um, and lots and lots of physicists can do the maths without necessarily giving you a picture of the world uh, that is entailed by the maths that they do. Uh, the dominant, the dominant interpretation among physicists of quantum mechanics is the Copenhagen interpretation, right? Which is where we get all this indeterminacy stuff from. But it's, it's not, it's not, it doesn't follow from the maths, right? And, and we, I think we do, we do our, our communities a disservice if we don't draw that distinction between a scientific theory and its interpretation or a scientific fact or discovery and its interpretation or, or for that matter, a text. And its interpretation. Mm-hmm. And once you have the distinction between an interpretation and an experience, I think that, that, that lets you go quite far. Mm-hmm. So <clears throat> one of the ways I've been thinking about getting at that tension is recognizing that the, at, at least for someone within a religious tradition, and if it's, you're a Christian theologian, there are different registers that you, uh, are speaking, uh, from. So, uh, in one sense, Christianity involves someone having and ident- identified with Jesus as the Christ, right? So there's this existential register to all you're speaking, uh, if you're speaking as a Christian, where you have identified Jesus as the Christ. Now, what that means is like a 2,000-year-old conversation with a lot of uh, different opinions in it. But you have a, like located yourself, and it's not location to an idea, but to a community of practice. 
And then there's this metaphysical register that, um, you know, is, is as abstracted as it gets that has constantly been a part of the church thinking about what it means. But that's because to say God was in Christ demands not just your response existentially, but that this human reveals who God is. So as long as the referent has to do with the one who made heaven and earth, then you're stuck doing metaphysics. And science has obviously changed that. Um, and I think there's the historical register in the sense that um, uh, we are a monotheism that understands who God is because of a continuity of relationship in history, maybe Israel, the person Jesus and such. So uh, there's an actual historical referent and that it, it we are a part of a historical community today. And so when when we think of the... I think that a lot of conservative Christians w- want to preserve a type of certainty that Christendom gave them, and and so they look t- to the metaphysical register to be you know some unquestioned Aquinas, a synthesis with Aristotle, and everybody's you know goes has been baptized Catholic, and so they desire a certainty and then mess around and don't understand what it is science is doing, and then I think a lot more uh, progressive Christians. Uh, have just stopped talking about the metaphysical register focused on ethics because they're uncomfortable saying the word God because the academic culture presumes a metaphysics that's unexamined. That in the academy, the, like, like your friend that you were describing, Mm -hmm. there's, there's, if you took the neutral science, you can have plausible interpretations of it Mm -hmm. that are philosophical interpretations that lead to high orthodox Trinitarianism, Sufi Muslim interpretation, um, uh, ecstatic natural, all sorts of different interpretations, and none of it's changed, except that theologians who aren't in the ghetto of the church that's scared of, you know, being vulnerable and such, uh, who they want to impress has a shared metaphysics is often unexamined. And so, I, like, I think the, at least for me as a theologian who's coming to the religion science conversation to learn and be impacted by it is trying to figure out how you negotiate those three different levels. Uh, and I remember when I was so post-structuralist, I would not have talked about God whatsoever. My decision to remain a Christian had to do was on sheer aesthetic grounds Mm -hmm. that I had this weird experience that was intensely religious while, um, in ketosis and decided to drink a lot of bourbon <laughs> and uh what and and I was reading the Luke's uh crucifixion narrative where Jesus says, you know, Father forgive them for they know not what they do. And the Father forgive them bit is fine because we should obviously we either have manufactured defaults or there's a purpose to these types of uh hang ups. But it was a we don't know what they're doing thing. That a community gathers where the most important truth you're ever going to get involves a reminder that you don't even know what you're doing and you could be making the worst mistake of your life. So it has to be done in the context of grace. So I had this, uh, I will live in a, I will operate within a religious community as if power is inverted through the cross, that ultimate reality loves you as a caring parent, and you try to embody such grace because we mm-hmm. all don't know what we're doing. Mm-hmm. And uh, there's good social science benefits uh, for participating in a religious community, so I'm going to be post-structuralist this way. Right? But now I would have very different answers. Mm-hmm. But my existential register has been very engaged the whole time. Right. Uh, I've changed my mind on Jesus' eschatology, which radically, re- radically reworks how you do Christology. Right? And then my metaphysics have changed dramatically. Mm-hmm. So like, I, I feel like the conversation around religion and science uh, is... Uh, doesn't recognize the multiplicity of communities you're interpreting from and then tries to tell a story as if the existential register hasn't always been primary, but it should be, I think, if you're in a community that confesses uh, that type of existential location. So I don't know what to do with that, but I, you know, y'all should fix this for me. I have a follow-up question to that. Um, And this is the role of desire. So, so, um, Again, in debates with my friend Sarah about about all of this, um, she's an atheist, well, agnostic atheist, somewhere in between those two, probably. Um, and 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 one of her core convictions is that the more that she desires something, the more suspicious that she should be of it, right? So if she desires a personal God that happens that just happens to be in the flavor of the evangelical tradition in which she grew up, she should very much challenge. She should she should question that mm-hmm. that she um, has. 
uh, plenty of theories of error that would <laughs> explain why she would have that desire and that that desire would not actually correspond to any sort of metaphysical reality or truth. So that's her kind of conviction about desire uh, when it comes to sort of the, the God question, right? I actually, um, in a similarly like existentialist kind of exploration as what you've been describing, um, I kind of come at that question from an, uh, the other angle, the other end of things, right? So, um, I love Wesley Wildman's work on religious naturalism. So I love his, I love, I love the sort of ecstatic naturalist kind of explorations that want to take seriously the experience of the, you know, the richly aesthetic and ecstatic experiences that are available through the spiritual technologies, you know, that we have available to us as, as, as human beings that are capable of a wide range of conscious experiences and embodied experiences. Right. But, but someone like Wildman would want to say, we can have all those things without having the God uh, that the, the, the God kind of component added on. Um, and so what I find interesting is that a lot of people have a real, real, um, real problem with natural, with that sort of naturalism, because you could say actually that subjectively the experience of the religious naturalist and the experience of the Christian are often quite similar as far as like the, the subjective experience of it, right? You're experiencing something transcendent. You're experiencing oneness with the universe. You're experiencing divine, you're experiencing some sort of sacred love, um, and these various, um, intense experiences that people have. And, um, there's, uh, you know, so you can get a long way with religious naturalism, but I find it really interesting that so many people have such, uh, um, the feeling of their heart sinking when they consider the possibility that, that is all there is, right? And there's this question of, is there metaphysical significance to the desires that we have? So to the extent that somebody is desiring God, desiring a relationship with a personal God, whatever, we, I mean, we can flesh out what we mean by personal God in a million ways, but whatever we mean by a personal relationship with a creator, um, with the, you know, with, with a divine lover of sorts, right? So, um, so, so no matter how you flash that out is sort of the existentialist desire for something more, a God beyond the experience that you can get in naturalism, for example, is that significant? So I immediately think of Caputo's book, the prayers and tears mm -hmm. of Jacques Derrida. So, and in it, he's, you know, playing out the relationship of Augustine and Derrida, who both have similar mom questions and then similar autobiographies mm -hmm. uh, that they wrote comparing each other. And Derrida tells his intentionally, mm -hmm. right, uh, to parallel uh, the confessions. Um, and if you look at some of the lines where Caputo's playing out, uh, if you do a phenomenological analysis uh, of Augustine and Derrida, they're surprisingly structurally the same, mm -hmm. right? And the difference is uh, not the structure of the call. It's a knowledge of the caller mm -hmm. and kind of the hermeneutical mm -hmm. event. Uh, and <clears throat> and so I think there – I don't. I imagine it probably correlates to certain personalities and stuff too. Mm -hmm. Some people are just a lot more comfortable not – like – like if right. you say ultimate mystery, they're like, all right, so it might not be BS. And others yeah. are like, ultimate mystery? Right. What the hell? Like, what are you talking like, about? <laughs> you, you want me to sell my everything I have yeah. and give it to yeah. the poor? You know, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. and now you're going to be like ultimate mystery ultimate me? Mystery, man. And yeah. and so yeah, I do think there's a um, uh, a definite uh, connection. Now I just want to go reread the book, thinking that question. That's. Uh, I think the thing you say about personality is is, is true, mm -hmm. basically, mm -hmm. in, in in lots of different ways. Um, so, but I think when we say that a lot of this boils down to what kind of personality you have, like mm -hmm. I, I I want to resist the idea that it means that it's indelible. Mm -hmm. right? Like I think our personalities can change, etc. But let's park mm -hmm. that for for a second. So you know the question of whether or not we should be suspicious of our desires. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, this is basically the difference between Jung and Freud, mm -hmm. right? Jung and Freud both think that we have desires for the divine. They both think that, um, uh, as it were, um, the, uh, b believing that there is a God who loves us makes us feel better. And Freud's interpretation of this is to be suspicious mm -hmm. and to call it wishful thinking. Mm -hmm. Uh, and Jung's interpretation of this is to say, well, it must fulfill some real need and mm -hmm. therefore there must be something to it. Uh, there is no adjudicating between these two positions. Mm -hmm. There just really isn't. No evidence can speak to it, right? Like it, it just is where you are coming from, not just with your metaphysical priors, but your like personality priors. Mm -hmm. There's a very, very similar distinction here between, um, Clifford and James, right? So, so Clifford's priors 
his epistemological priors are belief as few false things as possible, right? That's what he wants, to believe as few false things as possible. And if you take that to his logical conclusion, you just believe nothing. Because if you have no beliefs, then you have zero false beliefs. Mm -hmm. He's not optimizing for true beliefs, right? He's optimizing to reduce false beliefs. James is in the, in the other direction, right? He wants to optimize for having as many true beliefs as possible. And he doesn't mind having a few false beliefs if they creep in. He's not mm -hmm. worried about that. And so he gets accused of being sort of credulous, mm -hmm. right? And so he, he ends up in that direction. Now, I don't think there's any adjudicating between Clifford and James either, mm -hmm. right? It just, it's just where you set your epistemological priors. Like, do, mm -hmm. you, do you care about optimizing for true beliefs, having as many of them as possible with no regard for the false beliefs that creep in? Or are you optimizing for as few false beliefs as possible without caring about how many true beliefs you allow in? Mm -hmm. and, and like, I'm not sure that argument can be adjudicated in any way, evidential or otherwise. Yeah. So... Side note here, I think it's funny when Jonathan and I talk because people who are listening to this are going to think they're accidentally listening to their podcast on like 1.5 speed or two, two times speed because it's like we both like talk a million miles a minute and it's like people are going to be like, what did I, what did I do to my iPhone here? Um, I'm going to so, get the tweet. They're like, did you upload it yeah, at exactly. fast pace? So sorry. So, okay. I have a related question then on the personality. They can question. slower it. Yeah, okay. slower it. Yeah. Slower. Slow it down. No, slow it down. Everyone has to listen to this at 0.5 to 0.5 specs. Okay. My, here's a question then related to that about the personality differences thing. So another way of getting at the same question that I asked about desire is looking at the, um, the question of what sorts of explanations certain people find to be persuasive. Um, so, um, we are in Scotland and we have a very robust scene here in, um, analytic theology. Now, analytic theology, don't worry, it's okay, I'm not gonna go too deep into it. Analytic theology is a very, has a very, uses a very particular sort of method to talk about God questions, right? Well, we should, as an aside, everyone at St. Andrews know the sarcasm towards analytic theology is not a personal assessment of anyone engaged. Absolutely in it. not. And if you want to tweet <laughs> about anything else that's about to be said, it's a friendly rivalry, um, and I like learning across difference. And how would an analytic theologian say that? I don't know. I, d I don't know either. But what I say now to my friends at St. Andrews, and we're, and honestly, we are, I do have dear friends at St. Andrews. Um, and I spent some time working there as well. And what I find fascinating about analytic theology, um, sort of in conversation with other methods and ways of thinking about God and, 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 and theological method is that very different types of people or cognitive styles or personalities. I'm not quite sure what the correct terminology is here, but very different. People have very different experiences of how persuasive they find explanations and arguments in analytic theology versus other types of theology. So like what will be in a, like a Loctite argument that not only is understood as intellectually sound um, and methodologically sound by an analytic theologian, but they will also experience that as being existentially meaningful and powerful. Okay, so they like an analytic argument about God and so some some attribute of God um, will be experienced by many uh, many people in this camp as being um, of having um, liturgical, existential, spiritual, religious, personal significance, and um, that is fascinating because other people will get who will know the same method will be able to be fluent and operative in that world, but will absolutely not find those same sorts of explanations to be. Um, to be persuasive to them in any sort of existentially, you know, thick way. Um, so I am not sure what's going on psychologically there, but I'm fascinated by the different sorts of people that are drawn to different sorts of theological method. I'm wondering if you have any insight on, on that at all. Not really. I mean, but I guess it, it doesn't seem that surprising to me that this mm -hmm. is true, right? So um, the if you work in the human sciences, um, like, so I, I'm an experimental psychologist. Mm -hmm. Um, what, what you find is, is that people are attracted to different methods just anyway. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and, and that's not just a matter of competence as you were implying, mm -hmm. right. That, you know, people who do developmental psychology, um, are just as, as good at statistics as people who do, um, say in like neurophysiology or something right. like this. Right. Um, and like it, it does seem to boil down to a kind of preference, like what sort of speaks to you, what mm -hmm. resonates with you in, 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 in a special kind of way. Mm -hmm. And again, like, it's not clear to me that these are adjudicable things. They, mm -hmm. There doesn't seem to me to be the right, uh, like a right answer on, on some of these questions. Uh, and, you know, maybe in general, that is kind of my, my tenor for, mm -hmm. for a lot of approach, for approaching a lot of these questions, which th there are some, there are some debates that 
that are not adjudicable. Mm-hmm. And if that's the case, then you are free to choose one option or the other right. without worrying that you're being irrational or stupid right. or something like this. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that this, 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 this example that you're giving, you know, do, do you prefer, like, do syllogism speak to you or not? Right. right et cetera. Right. Um, that, that may well just be an individual difference. Uh, and if it does, then great. If it doesn't, then find a, a different way of doing, of sure. doing theology. So the, you know, one, so there's probably two parts of it. One, you self-select basically like what graduate Absolutely. school you go to. Um, but also, um, you know, schools, not just the type of theology done there will have their own personality, mm-hmm. right? So, uh, if you go, if, if you were at Claremont, you didn't have to go because you're interested in process thought to totally give off. You went to Claremont vibe mm-hmm. and all know the same vocabulary words. Um, yep. and so, uh, and, and you and you find it dumbfounding if people don't uh, think these conversations are as interesting as you do. And I re- I got uh, comments back from a reviewer on my next book who was like, "Your last chapter is so heretical." And I was trying to show uh, what was required if God uh, if 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 an open and relational deity is self thematized through the person of Jesus, it requires these metaphysical changes. And they're like. This is horrible, you know? Like, why would you even say that? And I just remember the first time I read it back to myself, I cried, right? I was like, <laughs> I actually think this is it. Yep, yep. that's that's what Trip thinks. Yep. And I remember giving a talk uh, in Los Angeles, which is its own spiritual ecosystem, to Claremont <laughs> people, and they, you know, they, they were digging it. But I also did this talk where um, at the uh, Los Angeles Skeptic Society where they said, we want you to come preach, and but not special revelation, mm-hmm. right? And so I give a like forty minute talk, uh, uh basically saying, um, you know, here's a metaphysical interpretation where the questions of of origin, mind, mm-hmm. uh, value, and beauty uh, have a metaphysical referent that mm-hmm. coheres with science. And I find it ultimately compelling. Mm-hmm. And in California, they were like, oh, my God, that was just so good. And I don't even believe in God. But if I did, it would totally be that one. And I mm-hmm. might. But you're also a minister, so it really creeps me out. And then there, so someone in the Q&A thing says, so how's Jesus fit in? And then I sit and explain it. And they're like, look, I have a lot of religious baggage. So I'm kind of an anti-Christian atheist. But if my minister had ever said that, yeah. but who all those people are totally Los Angeles yeah. spiritual. Yeah. And I have been on the bus in this city with some ardent atheists who were like, I don't, I don't know what the hell you're talking about. And I'm like, really? Cause like I got standing O at the skeptic society in LA for my, for this material I'm trying on you right now. Uh-huh. And so, <laughs> uh, so uh, just in case, uh, listeners think that this kind of relativism is, is specific to religious communities. Uh-huh. Like I want to remind people that, the Copenhagen interpretation for quantum mechanics is called mm-hmm. that because lots of the people who believed it were in Copenhagen. Yeah. Right. The kind of location specific, um, uh, like accumulation of particular positions yeah. is, is true in science and it's also true in philosophy, right? So I, I come from, I, I did graduate school in New Zealand. My philosophy department was full of, um, Austere nominalists who were human, uh, who were, who were, who were, uh, human, human, um, uh, uh, sort of anti-realist meta-ethicists, uh, all of them were atheists. And, and, you know, if you, if you tried to do a sociological study, you would find that Australasia is full of scientific realists who are, who are anti-realist about morality mm-hmm. and who are atheists and who are nominalists about metaphysics. Like, it's not just religious communities who, like, that, that are, that, that are, that relativize, you know, mm-hmm. different theologies in this kind of way. This just happens all across the intellectual world. Um, but, but I also, like, want to say that I, I don't think this means that, uh, all our beliefs are, uh, are relative to our tiny communities, right? Mm-hmm. So I think, um, Trip, you were saying earlier that you have these different registers, the existential one, the metaphysical one, et cetera. I think another way of thinking about this is that we live in concentric circles of, of epistemic communities, um, which is precisely the thing that I think allows us, if we are mindful of it, to speak differently in different contexts, right? So we, there are a bunch of assumptions when I'm in a church on Sunday morning, and these assumptions are, not contradictory with, but certainly different from, uh, uh, 
the context, the, the assumptions that are made when I'm speaking at an academic conference full of scientists, mm-hmm. etc. Et and 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 I think that the fact that our our beliefs are 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 context dependent um, is is not is not does not a consign us to to be totally relativistic. Um, but also, I think it's inescapable because not only do we know as Christians or know as scientists or know as, as Chinese people or as men or as women, we also just know as humans, right? There, there is something that constrains the sorts of things that we can say we know by virtue of our, our physiological apparatus, by our evolutionary history, et cetera. And I think in like, a lot of the hand wringing and worrying about, oh, you know, like, do I trust my desires? You know, like, are there scientific explanations that will lead me to believe that all my beliefs are biased? Like, in, in some ways, that's setting the epistemic bar much too high. Mm-hmm. Like, the fact of the matter is that we can't know as gods know. We can only know as humans know. And that's just going to be fallible and contextual. And that's okay. Like, I, I think we should just allow ourselves, uh, the, the limitations of, of, of humanity, uh, and our dependencies. So how would you both want address the concept of revelation? So I'll give like just one very um perhaps like a very subjective kind of, of uh, take on the importance of revelation. So I think, and I'm gonna bring it back to experience. I think this is something about revelation that is experiential at heart. Um and that Revelation is not accepted as such by every person who has the same sort of facts available to them, texts available to them. Something happens to make something revelatory, right? So the experience of what is revelatory is not objective, I don't think, um, at least not as it's experienced by the person. So like the phenomenology of revelation is going to be inherently like, it's just not going to be ob- objective. And I mean, I think this gets back to why I, think it is so fascinating to think about people who can admit the sort of neutrality of science on belief in religious kind of concepts, God concepts. Um, and it's a, it, like there are so many people out there who are like, yeah, I mean, if I had the experience that you're talking about, then I also would believe these things. But it's just that like, I, yeah, I can see that, you know, you have a plausibility structure for this belief system and it makes sense. I get it. It's just not compelling to me. Um, and I think it's fascinating to look at what launches people from one side of that line to the other. And I, that's what I consider to be revelation is sort of like when sort of the text or the, 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 the logic or the, the intellectual system becomes true to somebody that is fascinating. Like what shifts people two inches to the right so that now that they are on the other side of that line and something feels revelatory, they feel that they have, um, that, that the text has made, has been made alive to them, that this divine love has been made true to them in some experiential way. And again, there's a lot of fuzziness about what we mean by experiential, but something happens for people who are able to move from sort of a, a kind of cognitive neutrality when it comes to assessing the science on belief in religion, um, to put them into a camp where they're like, yeah, I'm actually, I actually think this is true. Um, so something happens there, and I think that is a really interesting scientific and a theological question. So, 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 okay. Speaking, uh, qua psychologist, uh, so as opposed to being a theologian and philosopher mm-hmm. for a moment, <laughs> right? It seems to me that there there is not very much difference between uh, revelation in a religious community and uh, and conjecture in a scientific one. Right. So what is a conjecture in a scientific, in a scientific context? It's, it's this sort of, um, non intellectually motivated idea that a bunch of people then decide is worth investigating, um, which either helps them to collect more evidence in the direction of the conjecture, uh, or, or helps them see evidence in a, in a new light. Right. So once upon a time, we all believe that the earth is in the center of the universe. And then someone says, um, what if, what if, what if we change the map and, and, and say that the sun is in the middle of, of the solar system? Uh, what, what difference would that make? Right. Now, when, when that happened in real life, right, when Copernicus redraws what the solar system looks like, um, he has no evidence that this is the case, right? So the, the Copernican system, um, at the time, um, arguably explained fewer observations than the very complicated uh, an unwieldy Ptolemaic system. So whatever is going on, it's not evidence-based belief, 
right? It's something else altogether. It's, it's here's an interruption in our current paradigms, which leads us to want to ask more empirical questions and helps us to see uh, current empirical data in a different light. And the same is true over and over again in, in, in different, in different uh, domains of science. Um, so it seems to me that, that revelation occupies the same kind of epistemic function in religious communities. Here's an idea which doesn't follow from, which is not entailed by our current um, religious and metaphysical commitments, uh, but, but it's a thing that as a community we think is worthy of investigation. It leads us to reread text. It leads us to ask new questions about the experiences that we have. It might even um, lead us to try to seek further experiences to then work out whether or not this, this thing which has interrupted our religious lives is worth not only paying attention to, but then, uh, but, but devoting ourselves to, right? So, so at least in, 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 within communities, and I think arguably within individuals, it seems like revelation and, and that kind of scientific conjecture, the, the kind of scientific conjecture that, that Cunians will think of as paradigm shifting mm-hmm. seem to, to be very, very similar, mm-hmm. right? Um, so, so what, what normative implications does this have? Well, you know, if you are, if you're Cunian about science, uh, then, then, you, what you might want to say is that uh, what we should do with conjectures is not to throw them away um, just because they're not justified by the evidence currently, but to but but to take them seriously and 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 see where they lead you to work out whether or not you want the new paradigm to replace the old one. And then the same thing will be true for 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 revelation in religious communities. If you are if you are even more Popperian than Popper, then what you want to say is to never believe anything or even entertain anything that isn't uh, that isn't the best explanation or has or entails the more the, the most uh, tr- like true observations or something like this. But but that you know that that's not even a sustainable position for Popper to hold, let alone for for anyone else. It seems to me. So so maybe that helps. Yeah. So w- what comes to mind is that especially when you think how theologians wrestle with the concept of revelation, part of it in the 20th century has been. Um, uh, in in what ways does God tell us who God is, and uh, the the conversations around religion and science in some parts of the academy were resisted precisely because they, in a sense, naturalized what was identified as the interruption of the transcendent other or the triune God. Uh, but on the other side, the, the your your insistence on it not being an object uh, coheres with uh, an insistence that it is a divine subject, right? So uh, when revelation becomes something that you possess as an object of reality, it's definitionally, at least for monotheists, not God, right? So, uh, and then if you think of how um, the monotheistic traditions uh, look at God, it's price, God reveals God'self in history where it's always mediated and it's always encountering finite beings and it's encountering communities of people that are in particular communities, not, uh, universal revelation to everybody. Um, and so I've been trying to figure out, uh, you know, if you think of the, di- of the different registers, what that historical register looks like, because, um, for example, I, I was, I get, last talk I gave when I was in, uh, America, this pastor's thing, but they were talking about religion and science. I, I had just talked about metaphysics and philosophy of science things. Then he said, yeah, but, if you think God was revealed in Christ, wouldn't that change how you interpreted all the evidence that's connected to the anthropic principle? And I was like, I guess. Like, but, and I hadn't thought about that. I just know that I learned philosophy of science from a very suspicious atheist, so I was mm-hmm. told what to do with it. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. And then I thought, actually, yeah. yeah, I could go with the weak version of it, coheres with this vision. And, and so, you know, it gets to a place where I feel like all three are playing back and forth and, um, what I feel like as a theologian, you're you're asked to do two things. One is how do you give a an articulation of the tradition that is impacted uh, and coheres with our best accounts of the world today, mm-hmm. uh, that's faithful to the tradition, to the community right. and its life in the spirit, experiencing reality and um, engaging science history and stuff. And then there's the task where you're justifying the viability of your religious tradition to your peers. Yeah. And it's kind of like you have to talk in either one. Yeah. Um, and if you talk off the record, I know plenty of people that do both in their head. Yeah. But in the academy, you kind of have to pick which one you do. Yeah. And yeah. if you sound too Christian, they're like, oh, 
Mm-hmm. And I found the only ones that will pay attention to certain things I do are religious fictionalist mm-hmm. because they find that <laughs> my interest in philosophy and science means my account of Christianity makes a lot more sense to them, even though they only came to it existentially mm-hmm. as a performative thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, I mean, how do you see like the uh, – does religion and science demand – uh, a kind of bracketing of God's self testimony in history or not. So you, so I think, I think I know what Jonathan's going to say here. Um, so, but I want to give a counterpoint to what I think he's going to say. So, but, uh, so a- Andrew Torrance, Andrew, anticipatory rejection. I know, I know. So Andrew Torrance as, at St. Andrews is a really interesting character because he's very involved in the science and theology conversation, right? But he is one of the few people in the conversation who's willing to come out and say, actually, we should question, if not reject, methodological naturalism. So what you were just saying is kind of getting at this, 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 um, conversation within science and religion about methodological versus metaphysical naturalism. So methodological naturalism is by and large taken as an assumption by most people in science and religion, which is that when you are going about the activities of science, you should assume that there are scientific and physical, there are, that there are physical causes and explanations, scientific explanations for all physical events in the world. So you should not be investigating a, an observation and um, posit God as a cause, right? So that that is not acceptable if you are a Christian who is a scientist because the revelation of Christ or that your, your commitment to the Christian tradition has changed the way that you must think about the relationship between God and nature. So, what happens for someone like Andrew Torrance is that methodological naturalism is actually a, a metaphysical capitulation that you as a Christian should not be making. Mm-hmm. And so he wants to say, um, we have kind of caved into what is an implicit metaphysical naturalism um, in trying to make ourselves scientifically credible. And that you, as a Christian, your allegiance should be first and foremost to recognizing that God can do things in the world. And if your methodological naturalism precludes you from recognizing those actions that are done by God, whether or not scientific science can like verify those, um, then you have lost the game. So I don't, I don't agree with that position, but that is a, that is his position. So there are those out there who, who would say that, um, actually there should absolutely be like our science should be different if we have Christian theological commitments. I mean, that's clearly insane. Oh my God. Right. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's insane because, okay, look, once upon a time, psychologists were all behaviorists and we were behaviorists because Skinner thought that um, that we can't read minds, okay, and then Chomsky comes along and and tells us why Skinner is wrong about lots of things, and we all suddenly become cognitive theorists. Now, what doesn't happen when we become cognitive theorists is that we suddenly develop magical mind reading skills, okay? So that doesn't happen, all right? Okay, you're a Christ- you're, you're you're a scientist and you happen to be a Christian. What doesn't magically happen is that you suddenly have all kinds of measurement tools that you didn't have before, right? Like, being a Christian doesn't mean that I can suddenly manipulate, um, like, divine causal powers and then measure whatever it is that I measure. Being a Christian does also doesn't mean that I can measure divine attitudes towards certain things in the world and then see if it's correlated with things that I can measure on earth, right? Like, all methodological naturalism is, is that, is, is a, is a recognition of the limitations of science. We can manipulate some things and we can measure some things and all those things are finite things in the world. What we cannot measure, what we cannot manipulate, is God. Therefore, we have to be methodological naturalists. It, it, there's, n- there's nothing like s- there's no conspiracy, right? There's no, like all this caving in stuff. I like just, I don't understand this at all, right? In some ways, it's a kind of idolatry of science to think that we we can't be methodological naturalists. It's 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 this belief that science can do more than it can do, right? All methodological naturalism is is a recognition that that we are limited in the things we can measure and manipulate. That's it. Mm-hmm. And so I, so I just I fundamentally don't understand the position. So what about the? Okay, so if you took his position, um, or the ones I know like it are not, you know, uh, analytic theologians, but uh, will insist that methodological naturalism tends to function to uh, enforce a metaphysical naturalism on um, uh, the theological community, and you can point to. Uh, everyone probably has some line where <laughs> if, if this is what your naturalism means, then it's supernatural and it, and it varies. So like mm-hmm. in a lot of the theological theologians that engage religion and science, mm-hmm. uh, depending on who you are, you'll define certain people that call themselves naturalists as supernaturalists. Mm-hmm. So, uh, like, oh, well, you think God is personal, so you're a supernaturalist. Or you think 
there's divine intervention type of uh of divine action that's supernatural but uh you know non-interventionist divine action isn't and here's here's how you explain it so the i feel like the the tension that comes up for uh someone who's trying to engage the sciences from uh a, from a theological position is uh more directed towards the assumed metaphysical commitments than the actual uh the actual science and i i'm interested like so in the psychological science what are the metaphysical assumptions that uh that you you like just to point out to go you're fine to see the data that way or you could interpret it that way it's obviously not required that uh maybe are less obvious to uh the dominant culture uh uh that's a good question um I don't – okay, so so here's the preface, right? To get from methodological naturalism to metaphysical naturalism, you have to fetishize science, right? You have to say that the only things that we're going to treat as real are things that we can measure and manipulate, right? Uh, or worse, uh, that we can quantify because most science now is, is quantitative science. Okay, so how does this play out in, in psychology? I think that um, a, a de-emphasis on – on on um on the role that various kinds of mental states play right is probably still uh so right so it's it's still the case that we can uh we can measure we can measure mental states to some extent manipulating them is a little bit more difficult um and then there are a bunch of things that we can't do for ethics reasons and those things tend to be bracketed out right so so we're happy to study um uh attitudes of various kinds, uh, cognitive biases of various kinds, but it's quite difficult to study like, uh, willing, I guess. Right. Like, uh, so, so questions about free will, right. I think are, are, just, are difficult for, for psychological scientists for, for various kinds of reasons. Um, that's not the same as saying, and, and so we bracket them out, which is not the same as saying that we exclude them from a, a whole picture of the world. Right. We just find them hard to study. Right. And I think, I think that's a really crucial distinction to make, right? Here are things that psychologists find hard to study. This doesn't mean that we don't think they're mm-hmm. real, right? So, so your ability to, to, cho- like to choose, to really choose between options, mm-hmm. right? In, in, in however metaphysically rich and thick way you want it to, you want to describe it. Like that, that's not really a thing that we do. And in part because we find it hard to, to, to run the studies. Uh, and so they don't fit into our theories. Right. There are lots of things that we, we do find difficult to measure. Um, and so they don't, they don't appear in our models. Um, that are, that are in the kind of like, uh, in, in the free will kind of camp. Right. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, so the, like one example that comes to mind that I regularly see pop up is like, if you, the, if a theologian talks about like the, a miracle or whatever, I think so many people assume a Humean definition of miracles. That what a theologian's really wanting to resist is namely God and the world are completely unrelated. And the only way you would verify the reality of God is to break the integrity of the world. Right. And so, um, uh, that I, I'm trying to think of like what, what are the theological phrases that, mm-hmm. that, that someone would go, yeah, 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 naturalism is, um, uh, problematic. But in, but I think there are, I mean, I think there are others, uh, and one of the questions that has popped in my mind I'm interested in is how the disc discourse of your hidden intuitions and desires, uh, how to describe them. For example, like the devil made me do it or how does our, our understanding of human frailty and human psychology help us understand the phenomena that in like the New Testament, you'll t- you'll see like you know like flesh and spirit or yeah. this type of. Uh, every time you hear someone write a book, they're writing as if they are somehow clear and concise. Right. And uh, or if you're preaching, you've prepared and written it, and now they aren't hearing your inner discourse while you're preaching it. And you get to some line, and you're like, I can't believe I wrote that. I guess I did believe that on Thursday, mm-hmm. right? Or you're you're giving this picture of this desire of full life in the spirit. And then you're like, yeah, but I'm also know that if I was just a little hungry, I would have been an asshole. Yeah. Right. And so the, like, how does our, the, the psychological sciences help make sense, interpret, infuse, give wisdom for the, uh, 
the discourse of the self in religious li- literature? I'm thinking. Okay, so I think that um, I think that one of the implications of of the psychological work is is something that I've mentioned already earlier, which is to at least make us um, more, more more humble about our uh, about where we where we end up, mm-hmm. right? Um, I, I I I I say the word I say humble, and I I don't want to immediately then jump to like suspicious or critical. I think these are these are very different. Um, uh, attitudes to take toward, toward your, your beliefs or desires, right? Um, all humility entails in this case is, is an openness to other people's experiences and, and where, and where they end up and a willingness to, to, to learn from, from other people's differing perspectives because you know that where you come from is very particular, uh, right? It, it might, you might believe something because you forgot to eat lunch or something like this, right? Um, I think, oh, that orientation, a willingness to entertain uh, the veracity of other people's beliefs, um, a willingness to 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 explore within and even without your own beliefs and desires, um, I think does not have to entail that you just stop believing anything that you like. Um, and the reason that it doesn't collapse into that is because the psychological science also uh, gives you um, also leads you to think that it's not just like peculiar religious beliefs that are that are pushed to and fro by these kinds of unconscious forces, right? It's, it's, it's all kinds of beliefs, right? And so, so there's this kind of warning about babies and bath, bath waters all over again. It's like, sure, you know, you could, if you, if you chose to be like an extreme skeptic. Um, but even that is a position that, that, that you might have landed at because you forgot to eat lunch today, right? So there's kind of like, you know, if, 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 Dar- if Darwinism is a universal asset, Right. Then, then this kind of psychological science is too. It's like an equal opportunity game, game in this way. So it's right. So I think the implications are just that, um, it, there's a funny way in which it helps you to avoid extreme skepticism, acknowledging that even that is a position that might be the result of unconscious forces while, while helping you, I think, entertain, helping you not be a fundamentalist by anything. Yeah. So maybe the summary is, you know, the, the psychological science helps you not to be a fundamentalist by anything. <laughs> it's not a bad place to be. I think. So, um, how would you ask the question to Jonathan that you asked at the Gifford lectures um, when you were talking about uh, the uh, Pascal Bouillet? Bouillet, how do you want to say? Yeah, Pascal Bouillet. Yeah. yeah, his his book. Oh, minds make societies. Because mm-hmm. um, I feel like that's a good example of a uh, the the non-theist expression of the same conversation we're having. Yeah, I think it was, I think what I was, ta- I was asking at the Gifford lecture was a question. It was, I think it was a, 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 a basically a, a justification question of a theologian, right? Mm-hmm. So um, given that um, many theologians are actually quite happy to accept wholesale sort of cognitive science um, descriptions and explanations for um Phenomena that would have previously been considered to be obviously supernatural or revelatory or something, given that we have explanatory frameworks or could eventually have plausible explanatory frameworks for basically any human phenomena. Um, um, what then allows us to kind of step into that something more from where do we draw that uh, something more. And I think somebody, um, many theologians would rely on tradition or scripture or some, or some sort of like other source of knowledge outside of, um, um, uh, of the sciences. Uh, but I think my question is like, given that we could even have plausible descriptions of why you would find scripture or tradition compelling, uh, you know, given that even those other sources of authority that you rely on for your theological knowledge also have, you know, we also understand why those would be compelling to you. Um, uh, how, how to somebody, how to a world that just doesn't feel the need for God, for example, like, how do you, how do you, I don't say, ju- I think justify is the wrong word here. Cause I'm not actually asking for like an apologetic defense of Christianity. I'm asking how do you describe your own sort of ability to commit to this framework that is experienced as real by you that others just don't experience. Yeah. Uh, so, okay. So I almost always, I have two answers to the same question, <laughs> uh, depending on how you take the question. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, one, one way is to, 
is to say that I'm not usually that interested in persuading other people well, of course, to believe yeah. what I believe. Um, and, and, and part of that is a recognition of like epistemological pluralism, mm-hmm. right? Like I come from, uh, I come from a place and I was brought to this place by my upbringing and my culture and my mm. particular set of intellectual proclivities, et cetera. And, and other people are different. Yeah. And I'm, I'm perfectly happy in most cases to, to just let that lie in that mm-hmm. way. And I, you know, I, I think that, that even that attitude comes from, my own social and cultural background. So I, I come from Malaysia. It's uh, constitutionally a Muslim country, but uh, but it, but it's not. It, but it's, it's only a majority Muslim country by a little bit. So sixty yeah. percent of the population is Muslim. So so there isn't Malaysia isn't a place that I would describe as having any kind of um, religious hegemony, mm-hmm. right? Uh, so for example, in my in my state, my home state, Good Friday is a public holiday, which isn't mm-hmm. in America. Um, Christmas is a public holiday. Mm-hmm. And so we, we live perfectly happy, uh, happily with each other, like pluralistically. Mm-hmm. And, and there's something about having encountered British people and Americans and New Zealanders who, who come from, uh, at least historically, what was a hegemonically Christian yeah. country. There's a lot of this worrying about about, you know, justifying their particular positions sure. and, and persuading other people toward their particular positions, which I just don't have, mm-hmm. uh, in part, I think, because I didn't grow up in that kind of place where there was any whiff of hegemony. Um, the, the other un- answer to this question is, is I think some, uh, I'd like to pick up something that Tripp said earlier, um, just in passing, which is that science has changed metaphysics. I think it's only, I think, I think that's true, but it's done so in a very peculiar and tragic way, which is that, um, we have all just given up. Uh, on doing any interesting metaphysical work and assume that scientists will do it for us. Mm-hmm. So we no longer use our own categories. We use whatever category science, scientists give us. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, the example that I always cite is, you know, these days theologians, it, like, well, like, not all theologians, I'm sure, but some theologians have given up talking about what a human being is. They're mm-hmm. just happy to say what a human being is, a homo sapiens, mm-hmm. whatever that means. Um, but, but I think we do the same thing with causes, mm-hmm. right? So, so we say, uh, we say that scientists now have perfectly good explanations for X. Mm-hmm. But what we mean is they have perfectly good explanations for a particular kind, mm-hmm. right? Because they, because scientists understand causation in a particular way, and in a way that's most amenable to manipulation and measurement. Um, but, but why give up on, on the multiplicity of causes? Mm-hmm. Why, why give up on the Aristotelian scheme or, or, you know, or whatever metaphysical, metaphysical scheme you, you, right. you choose to adopt? Right. It seems like the way we lose the battle is precisely by relinquishing our, our metaphysical and ontological exactly. duties to, to scientists. Quay scientists, I'm not paid to do the job of reflecting on what causes are. Mm-hmm. All I'm paid to do yep. is to, is to study what the particular causes are on this particular understanding of causes mm-hmm. of, and of, and of causation. And, and so, and so it seems like one response that the theologian can give to the question is say, look, you know, yes, we have perfectly good account of a particular kind, uh, about, you know, why people have the beliefs they do or whatever. But, but science has nothing to say about these other kinds of causes, right. about formal causes or final causes, et cetera. Mm-hmm. And maybe there's a job there to justify why we should care about final and formal causes. But, you know, but, but that, but that, that debate is a double-edged one, right? It's, it's true that metaphysicians probably have to justify why we need final causes and formal causes. But at the same time, um, it seems unfair to then, uh, tell the sci- to, to then, you know, let, let, let the austere nominally scientists get away with not having to justify why we have gotten rid of final and formal mm-hmm. causes, et cetera. So that, that, that's my two responses to that question. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, that I find the recognition of the different types of causation helpful. And one of the things that, uh, do you think part of it is the larger university structure and the way you're educated for doing science in the sense of as the disciplines over time get more specific and funding goes for very, very specific research things Mm -hmm. over time is connected more to global corporate capitalism's investment in the education rather than the round making of citizens. You have less people engaged in the sciences that are even familiar with philosophical categories so the uh inherited unexamined metaphysics of much of the science it, they don't see it that way and then they speak it because mm-hmm. i like just in uh the blind emailing people that are doing research in brain science mm-hmm. and then telling them about our project followed by my general interest is uh like leads me to think they wouldn't pass philosophy 101 and they are using millions of dollars to do things, mm-hmm. right? And in 
the, I couldn't do the math they're doing. So it's not like a mm-hmm. uh, I'm high and mighty. I just am thinking uh, some of the issues that we're running into as Christian theologians engaged in the science, in the scientific study of religion, and in the history of your tradition uh, might be that the institutions we are wed to uh, have a financial and uh, cultural trajectory mm-hmm. that uh, funds a, a silent metaphysical commitment. Yeah, this is so true in the divine action debates, actually. I mean, obviously, I just wrote a book about this. but yeah, the, a great book. You want to say the no, title so people Okay, can... Divine Action in the Human Mind, but it's, it's expensive. So, you know, get your libraries to buy it, but please don't buy it. Um so my publishers really hate me, by catalog. the way. <laughs> Cambridge University Press hates me, and this is why. I'm like, don't buy my book. Um, but, uh, yeah, no, I mean, this is exactly where the, where the divine action debate in the last, like, 30, 40 years has gone wrong um, because we uh, – as a whole, as a group of basically mostly theologians have decided that non-interventionist divine action is the way to go. But non-interventionist divine action, for example, like usually presupposes some very negotiable and debatable um, metaphysical positions, such as that you have a, um, like, well, for sure about the nature of uh, causation, a very particular understanding of the laws of nature, um, and also a God world model in which you have a default scenario for the natural world that ex- that is is um, self sufficient and independent of divine action to begin with, right? So these are all very suspect um, co- convictions um, that don't actually come from the sciences; they come from you know elsewhere, right? So that's but 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 the desire there is to be credible. So there's a desire for credibility. It is a desire to be able to. Um, posit theological questions that are amenable to scientifically informed answers. So our, you know, friend Phil Clayton would say that he's doing seek, uh, the, 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 that they're seeking traction, right? So traction seek, seeking is, is sort of like the name of the game in science and religion, trying to find those points where, where, where science and religion can, um, can provide a fuller, uh, description of reality together. Um, and, and, but what actually that ends up meaning is that, Science, contemporary science, whatever the whatever the the, the consensus is at the at current moment, tends to be considered the final arbiter of what things really are, right? And that is sort of the litmus test for whether or not you're intellectually credible. So the divine action debate is a perfect example of one area within theology where we have completely kind of lost lost the game there. Now there has been what I've called a theological turn, and there have people been people who have wanted to sort of like reclaim theological territory here and sort of say, actually, you're assuming a lot of things that are not actually indicated by the sciences themselves. Um let's have a talk about that. But then you open yourself up to the charge that you are not engaging with science at all. Right. So then you then you say, well you're just sort of it's a special pleading. You're just asking for theology to, to be reinstated as the queen of the sciences and tell science what conclusions can be drawn. Um, and so, so you do, there is quite a bit of, um, there is quite a bit of, uh, uh, disgruntled conversation in science and religion and the larger theology conversation right now about exactly this question. Oh yeah. I'm always very ready to blame capitalism for all kinds of things. (laughs) Uh, so, so I, I think it's absolutely true that the incentive structures in academia are such that, um, we, we, we convince, um, uh, scientists to specialize in the thing that they happen to be very good at, which is, you know, crunching the numbers, collecting the data, and to spend very little time reflecting on, 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 you know, questions that you might think of as philosophical questions or, or, or conceptual questions. So, so, you know, in, in biology, how this pops up is, is, um, is that, um, we're, we're happy to create taxonomies and not think about whether or not, uh, our, our way of dividing up things into species and other other tech other techs are is that real does it cleave nature is it joints we, we don't encourage biologists to answer questions like that um there's a really good book by a guy called adam Beck adam becker called what is real question mark and it's about it's about the the debates over uh over the interpretation of quantum mechanics um and his thesis is that the copenhagen school discouraged people from thinking about um, what the, ma- what the mathematics means for a physical description of the world. And, and there's this phrase which, which appears uh, a few times in the book, which, which he, he gets from, uh, I, f- I forget where, I forget who, to whom he attributes this quote, but it's, it's shut up and calculate, mm-hmm. which is the kind of thing that physicists are, are in, in the Copenhagen school are encouraged to do. So, so I think all that is true. That, that in, to, to a great extent, there are just these financial pressures, um, that, that, that push people in these directions. But I think there is another more basically human thing that's going on, which is that scientists found something that we, we're actually really good at, right? Mm-hmm. We're really good at, mm-hmm. at collecting data, 
crunching the numbers, making predictions, um, creating technologies. And, and even if there weren't any, uh, financial, um, uh, benefits to any of the, any of these things, just the feeling of being able to succeed at doing something is, is great. Whereas a lot of scientists feel like we've been arguing about these philosophical categories and theological questions for a long time. And there doesn't seem to be that much progress. Like there, there's, there's not this subjective experience, the sort of dopamine injection of like, ah, like it's, here's a new thing that I can latch onto. So, so I think, you know, setting aside the, the, the financial and status based incentive structures altogether, I think there's just that basic thing that, that when scientists, when they discover it, when we, when we go to grad school and discover that we can do this thing, produce what we think of as knowledge, like we, we, we focus on doing that because it makes us feel really nice when we can, make a discovery and whereas reflecting on what it means or how to embed it in a larger picture of the world like that's as it were it's too hard okay so something popped in my head that uh when you talk about the different um types of causation and that science is just really good at like efficient causation investigation especially if you can quantify it right if, if part of our larger project god in the book of nature is rethinking right the notion of nature and God's relationship to nature in the in the in these different areas. How uh, how do you see that we're good at exploring efficient causation, uh, in a sense shaving down uh, the nature of nature? Uh, wh- how has the scientific investigation and that we're good at it and have success reshaped the category nature uh, that? Uh, we're now reckoning with the consequences of a culture that has a rather uh, efficiently managed concept. I, I want to push back on the idea that scientists are good at efficient causation, right? So what we're good at is thinking of causation in 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 what's essentially statistical mm-hmm. Keteris paribus terms, right? Um, most scientists have no idea what it means, uh, what efficient causation is, right? When we attribute causation to something, all we mean is you take two groups and you you keep everything constant you manipulate one thing and you produce you produce a difference between the two groups and then we say that the variable that we manipulated causes the effect and and we don't go any further than that right um it's our 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 received notions of causation are uh are best understood in the context of experimental design uh in the experimental case and in a statistical controls for extraneous variables in the correlational and longitudinal cases. And then we take that and we generate predictions. So, so causation for us is, is A, a statistical and B, a predictive concept. There, there's, there's no metaphysics being done. So, so, so I, d- I don't necessarily think it's true that, that what scientists are good at is efficient causation. We don't even know what that means. Um, I think what you do about that is, is to, is to re-raise the question of what causes are, right? And, and so philosophers of, of the special sciences, uh, so philosophers of biology, philosophers of, phys- of physics are, uh, including like perfectly secular, like non-religious, right? People who are not interested in religion at all, um, are bringing those kinds of questions back to the debate, right? So, so in a funny kind of way, and I, I find this very amusing, um, be, being an Aristotelian, that it seems like Aristotle is back in, in both the mm-hmm. philosophy of biology and the philosophy mm-hmm. of physics. Yep. And so, so I think to the extent that philosophers, sec, perfectly secular philosophers can try to convince scientists to, to ask questions and think a bit about, about, about causation as a metaphysical category and not just an empirical one, one about relations between, between variables. Like that's already progress. I think, um, I, I don't, I don't know if, I don't know if theologians need to do that much special work at the moment because we're still so like, it, there's a sense in which we're not, we're not anywhere near ready for like final causes, right? Like it's, it's causes in general have, like we scientists have just redefined causes to mean almost nothing that, that we have a long way to get to before we can think about what the different kinds of causes are. There's, there's just a lot of work to do between mm-hmm. philosophers and, and scientists. So how has that reshaped the notion of, uh, of nature? But like if most of what most cultures prior to ours where the, um, Public squares, common assumptions are essentially the things that are dominant concepts in the academy at a given point and then dominant uh, narrative structures in culture producers. 
uh, that you, the, both of those used to be the church in Christendom. Um, and the origin of the whole two books metaphor was in Christendom. And then the, the rise of experimental science and such, I think, um, has reshaped both the cultural narrating structure of culture, the, the way the stories it tells itself and, uh, the authority structure for, for truth and things. And so I wonder if there, like, how do you see, uh, re-engaging in that concept of the book of nature theologically, uh, and, and aware of maybe some of the suspicions we should have because of the power of science in the last sure. couple hundred years. I, I think this is where theologians can make friends with everyone else in the humanities, right? So, so one of the, one of the, the worst things that's happened in the history of theology and the, the early modern history of science is to think of science as, as useful, right? So, so in, instead of trying to understand the world and marvel at it, what we've, what we decided like 400 years ago was that science should, should be like utilitarian, basically utilitarian. Mm -hmm. And so that, that meant that our interest in causation was just basically interest in manipulation. That our interest in knowledge is interest in prediction, right? And so where, where theologians and, and other scholars in humanities can, can come in and say, wait a second, isn't there more to knowing about the world than your ability to predict or manipulate things, right? And, and, so, so that, the, the, the book, here, here's where the, the book metaphor, I think, becomes a very useful one. Because we, we, we understand books that are utilitarian. So like, uh, manuals for how to fix your car. And then we understand books that are for, for pleasure. Right. So like, uh, Marilyn Robinson novel, etc. And to the extent that we can bring that latter category back into conversations about science, I think, I think the, the better off mm -hmm. we will be. Better off in no kind of like interesting, measurable way, but, but better off as just, you know, we'll come to a healthier place. It will make a lot of these conversations, I think, much, much easier if we, if we, if we stop people from thinking, uh, of science as a purely utilitarian thing. Now, now it, it's true that the scientists who are listening, uh, will resist the idea that they are utilitarian scientists because it's not like, you know, I'm interested in how to like build faster engines or cure cancer. But, but I'm afraid to say that even those of us who think of ourselves as, as pure scientists or blue sky scientists, we are infected by this idea, um, that science has to be about the manipulation of nature mm -hmm. and, and, and predicting stuff. And, and, and the, the kind of, Evidence of this is the way we think about things like causation, right? We have just, we've just absorbed all this sticky stuff, even if that's not what our explicit goals are, are in, in our doing science. Do you have any other questions there? No, I think you just said everything that there is to be said on the subject. Oh, <laughs> real. Wow. That's a, that's a, that's an endorsement there. <laughs> well, um, yeah. Thanks for hanging out. And, Fun uh, times. Good times. Thanks for having me. It's fun. Yeah.